tonight from Dublin City Centre, live from Paddy Power's Museum of Mischief, some of the most loved, most controversial and best sports stars of their generation are about to face the original mischief maker. Tonight's guest was a midfield general in a Liverpool team that dominated the 70s and 80s. As a player, he started in three World Cups. His managerial career took him to Rangers, Liverpool, Galatasaray, Southampton, Torino, Benfica, Blackburn and Newcastle. And he's here tonight. Let's give it up for Graham Souness. Graham, let's get one thing out of the way before we yeah. start. When you were manager of Blackburn Rovers, Damien Duff was one of the players you had. Yep. There were rumours that you had something against Catholics and that you had something against Irish people. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where they came from, given that my first wife or family are from Ireland. My wife's mother, my mother-in-law's cousin is Dickie Rock. So... so you know, my, my kids are Christian Catholics. I've now got a, another Irish wife. Can't get away from you buggers. It's, it's a, and now I'm working here. So that was absolute bollocks. Right. <laughs> and I want to take you back. Your first club was Spurs. Hmm. Great manager there, Bill Nicholson. First man to win the double in modern times. You couldn't break into the first team, mm -hmm. despite your obvious talent. And you asked to leave Spurs. Mm -hmm. Tell me why, and tell me what you said to Nicholson. Well, I used to, when the team, from 18 onwards, when the team went up on a Friday, in those days they put the team sheet up, and I'd knock on his door saying, you know, why am I not on the team? And at the time they had Martin Peters, who was a World Cup winner, Alan Mullery, England international, and sometimes captain of England, and Steve Perriman, who was a couple of years older than me, but we played in the same youth team for a while. And I felt I was better than any of them. Because I've always sort of been, I've always had a really high regard for yeah. my ability. Yeah. Um, so I kept knocking on the door and he got cheesed off with me. And eventually he sold me and he sold me to Middlesbrough, which was as far away from London as he could possibly get me. And that was the first time in, in my life as a player. And it turned out to be the only time where I had to sort of think, maybe I'm not that good. Yeah. Last, last year for maybe... A, Second and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sorry to sound arrogant, but that, that stood me in good stead going forward. Yes. At Middlesbrough, your manager was Big Jack, Jack Charlton. Mm -hmm. How did you find Jack as a coach? He was great for me. He basically said to me, you can, there's two doors for you. There's one where you, you've got talent, you could end up doing something, might be a player, or you can choose the other door where there's been hundreds before you that have had ability and chosen not to do anything with it. Right. And it was black and white. There was no arm around the shoulder. There was no, no sort of niceties about it. It was, it was brutal. It was a, that's one door and that's the other door. What are you going to do about it? And, and that, I look back at my career and that was, a, that was an important moment for me. Now, Jack, as manager of the Irish team, wanted long ball, put him under pressure, don't take chances. Mm -hmm. Was he like that? 100%. It was all about playing one-twos with God kick it as far and as high as you can and push him behind it. We had David Mills and John Hickton who were too big up and at him centre forward. And we just used to get it long and push in behind and feed off them. So I was there for four and a bit years. They sold me for a record transfer fee between two English clubs from Middlesbrough to Liverpool. What was different about Liverpool? You know, it was full of really you know, serial winners, if you like. They'd won everything, just won the European Cup. Yeah. And I didn't feel inhibited in any way, you know, I walked into that dressing room and again, because of my personality, I wasn't, you know, in the big time. First game was at West Brom and I'm in the dressing room at West Brom, a quarter to three, I'm looking around the dressing room, nobody said anything to me, so the great Joe Fagan, who was an absolute genius when it came to football and man management, yeah. he was a man manager. Bob Paisley was the he, he was manager. silent, didn't say yeah. a lot, but Joe was the, you know, he was the real cutie, really smart. And then Ronnie Moran was a, he was a bad cop. Joe was a nice guy. So I said, Joe, can I have a word with you? And he said, yes, son, what is it? And, and when Joe spoke, he spoke with a soft voice. You had to lean in. So he's standing in front of me and I said, Joe, I've been here a week and no one's said anything. How does he want me to play? Now, Joe very rarely swore and he said, fuck off. We've spent all this, we've spent all this money on you and you're asking me how to play football. <laughs> now, and turned and walked away and that was the first and last question I ever asked of any of them. <laughs> So that showed you what Liverpool was about. It was all about your responsibility to deal with it. Yeah. Now, the team that uh, emerged, 
during your period that you ended up captaining. You won the European Cup three times. Mm -hmm. If there was one important aspect of that club at that time, what was it? The secret was the players they had and the attitude the players had. Yeah, they liked to go out and have a drink, but they did it at the right time. Yeah. It was just about players doing the right thing, turning up for training and being bang at it every day. You know, train as you play. You know, you're expected to, you know, the same tempo, the same intensity. And you'd be guaranteed once a week, someone, because of the intensity, someone would be shaping up, squaring up with someone in training. Guaranteed. Yeah, training ground rows aren't necessarily a bad thing, are No, they? no. I mean, again, if, you, if, if you're asking your players to be training the way you want them to play, yeah. which is high intensity, you can't train them for long, and you've got to expect that there will be situations where, you know, someone will catch someone, sometimes by accident, sometimes yeah. on purpose... You know, there's obviously a bit of that going on as well in the yeah. small games. Yeah. Um, it's inevitable. You know, you're young men with lots of testosterone flying around. Yeah. And you get 25, 30 guys together, they ain't always going to like each other very much. They won't be in love with each other. There will be some animosity amongst the group. Uh, Bruce Grobelar. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, the guys who played with him seemed to like him. Yeah. And how, how difficult was it to well, think that he might do something well, daft. Well, Brucey was a top goalkeeper. I mean, at my time at Liverpool, Ray Clemens and Bruce Grobler. There was nothing in them. Bruce, arguably a better athlete. Clem, you know, just a better goalkeeper because he was steady Eddie. Bruce was a footballer but played in the wrong position. Bruce, <laughs> I, let me explain that. Bruce should have been a number nine. You know, one of them running to the crowd, kissing his badge after he scored another goal. Started discerning as a midfield player and you're halfway up the your half, and you're getting a shirt from the right-hand side or the left-hand side, I'm free, I'm on, and you look around and it's your fucking goalkeeper. <laughs> so, but Brucey, Brucey was your, what, what Brucey would do, he would come for every cross he thought he could get his hands on, yeah. and he would come for two or three and not get them, the fourth one is still coming. He, 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 he had big balls, seriously. He, nothing, nothing ever faced him. Big character. OK, let me ask you about Kenny Dalglish. He's one of the great figures in the game. How great was he? I was fabulous. Big, you know, brave. Not big. No. Strong, but a big heart. Just had a football brain that few people have. So yeah. Kenny and I used to room together. My last game was for Liverpool in Rome. Um, against from European Cup final. Yeah. Kenny used to take a sleeping pill. Within yeah. 10 minutes, he's, he's fast asleep. So but there was a 10-minute period where he used to talk. I've yet to find out what it was, but some sort of language that okay, no one could understand. Talk absolute bollocks. Yeah. So prior to him going to sleep, the television was loud next door. So I'm on the phone asking the, the reception to lower it. Nothing. I'm on the phone. Can someone come and tell the guy to lower it? Nothing. I'm out banging on the door. Nothing. So eventually, Kenny takes his tablet, he's fast asleep, and I'm having to listen to this fucking noise. Anyway, I, mean, so I get to sleep. So Kenny and I are leaving in the morning to go down for breakfast. The person is coming out of the room next to us, and it was our fucking manager. <laughs> and I said, I said, boss, you fucking kept us awake. I said, sorry, boys, we opened the second bottle of scotch last night. Had to finish it. <laughs> so we go for breakfast, we go to the training ground, they've been stitched up. Nobody had bothered to go and look at the training ground. It was meant to be perfect. It was a ploughed field. We didn't train on that. We came back. We're having lunch. And then Joe got his spoon, tapped uh, his glass and said to the waiters, do you mind leaving us, boys? So we're all nudging. We never had team talks. We never spoke about the opposition. Hadn't mentioned Rome up to then. Mm. So we're all going, what the fuck is he going to say? Yeah. He stands up and he's, he's sort of looking into the ceiling and looking into the distance. And he said, big game tonight. Um, these are a good team they've got some World Cup winners they've got a couple of good Brazilians they're at home but it must be a good team they won the league and be some good teams on the way to the final he said no, it can't be as good as us now the bus leaves at 5.30 make sure no one's late that's it and that was it yeah and so, you so that, that was Liverpool European Cup final today you've got to take them through chapter and verse till every single Every single player you're playing against, the strengths, the weaknesses, where you might... We would just go out and play. But you left Liverpool uh, to go to Sampdoria. Yeah. Tell me what you learned in Italy, if anything, about the game. 
It was tactics, 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 tactics. Fucking hell, tactics. Yeah. And I actually found Italian football a doddle. You got possession of the ball, the opposition retreated to yeah. well inside their half. As and a that's where the game started. You could get the ball, turn and get your head up without anyone confronting you. It's not like that anymore. Everyone's after you. How far away are the Liverpool group of today from the Liverpool group you were a part of? I don't think they're far away at all. I think, really? I think they're capable. I think they've got strength and depth. I think they've got some fabulous players. They've got the hardest thing right, which is scoring goals. Yes. You know, those front three would cause yeah. problems for anyone. I think the introduction of Van Dijk yes. is, has been such a plus. If he is the real deal, Liverpool will be the real deal. Now, let me ask you about their main rivals in England mm. at the moment. Pep Guardiola's Manchester City. Mm. I think that Pep Guardiola has a blind spot. I think he doesn't really think about the balance of his team. Mm. Do you have the same doubt that I have, or are you with the others who say... No, I'm with you on that. I think his attitude is, we're, we're going to have so much of the ball, we'll just outscore whoever we're going to play against. It doesn't matter how good you are. There'll be a time when the game's drifting a bit, or you might be on the back foot. And I think that's the time for experienced players to work that period out in a game and, and, yep. and be less adventurous. I think just to think you can go out all guns blazing and be on it for 90 minutes going forward but against the appear, very best teams. That appears to be what he thinks. He's wrong, isn't he? Well, his attitude is, we're, we're so good at that. Yes, we will occasionally get caught defensively, but the, 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 over a season, we will, that will even itself out. It's a bit like when we were at Liverpool. Our principle was holding a high line. We knew that two or three times a year we would get caught. Yeah. But the overall input to our game of going up the pitch and being not far apart in the three parts yeah. of the team, we're all together, yeah. that far outweighed the risk of being caught occasionally by yeah. someone running behind us. Yeah. So that's in the big picture of nine months, Cups, League, him playing like that, he thinks that will win the day. And I'm sure he's aware of the vulnerability of his time at Barcelona and, and the group he's got now and asking everyone who's... You know, defenders, a lot of them, the majority, I would say, are not comfortable taking the ball of goalkeepers. Yeah. But he thinks the downside to that is easily outweighed by the advantages further up the pitch and the way we want to play. Uh, let me take you on to one of the most fascinating parts of your story. You went to manage Rangers. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a piece of film of people reacting to Graham, who had the audacity and the courage to go against the grain. He signed Morris Johnson, Mo Johnson, who was a former Celtic player and a Catholic for uh, Rangers. Let's have a look at that piece of film. Rangers' controversial new signing, Morris Johnson, has given his first interview about life with his new club. Mo spoke exclusively to Jim White about the prospect of turning out for Rangers against Celtic at Parkhead next month. I remember Morris Johnson telling me not too long ago he was, he was looking forward to running out in front of the jungle. You will be doing that, Mo, but in a, in a different jersey, in a Rangers jersey. Um, have you thought about that fixture? Well, I haven't thought about it. OK, things will be difficult there. but. As I say, it's an old firm match. I played in an old firm match. Don't forget, I played in front of the Celtic fans when they booed me when I left. So having says that, if I can score against them, well, who knows? You look happy and well contented. Oh, Jim, it's, it's really a football story. OK, there might be the sectarian thing coming in it, but at the end of the day, I've signed a contract, entering into a contract, being a football contract, nothing else, and I aim to see that contract out. His track record. Um, speaks for itself. He scored goals in his time before in Scotland. He scored goals when he went to France and he scored goals at international level. And I'm sure he'll get goals for us again next year. Now, there's no getting away from it. He's the first Catholic to sign for Rangers. What's your reaction to that? Well, obviously, there's a lot of considerations we have to take into account. The main one being, David, that he is an out and out quality player. Are you he... troubled at all about the pressures that will be on him as the first Catholic to play here? There'll be pressures on all my players next year because we now have a big squad. There's no one who's going to be an automatic choice, and that includes Morris. Wasn't bad of a lad, was he? Yeah, it was a proper moustache, yeah. <laughs> it took a lot of um, fortitude and courage to make that decision. Uh, did you ever any, have any doubt? No, no, I'm a football person, first right. and foremost. I was brought up in the most loving, caring environment. I'm the youngest of three sons. I had a, 
had the most magnificent childhood. My mum and dad were proper people. There wasn't an ounce of bigotry in our family. It would right. never be allowed. Older people in the in the audience, I might remember a guy called Ewell, certainly. Peter Marinello? Yes. Ended up going to Arsenal. Arsenal, yeah. Well, we lived in a prefab, and he lived just across the field from me, and we used to walk to school together. He was a year old, I think a year or maybe two years older than me. And we'd walk to school together, and I'd go in my gate, and he'd walk around the corner and go to the Catholic school, and we shared the same playing field. And there was never issues. We used to have snowball fights in the winter. Yeah. That was as, you know, that was as bad as it got. And then I'd wait for him, coming back from school, and walk back together. You know, I'm, I get the job at Glasgow Rangers... Second, third question at the very first press conference, you know, would you sign a Catholic player? And hadn't done in 119 years of their history. So I said, yes, of course, would if the right one came along. And, and to a man, all the press sort of looked to the ceilings, yeah, we've heard all that before. And then a couple of, couple of years later, we signed Morris Johnson. And that, whether they like it or not, was the correct thing to do then, and the club have benefited since then. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's, but it's, yeah. we're, we're not, that was when... Yeah. 19, whatever, you know... That stuff belongs in the dark ages. That, it should never have been allowed to understand why it's happened in history, but that should never have been allowed to be the case. And, it was 119 years of not standing Catholic, but it's absolute nonsense. And it should be said that when you went to Rangers, they'd had a bad period. Celtic were the dominant team in mm -hmm. Glasgow. You won, I think, five. Uh, I was there five years and one or four times. But when I went to Rangers, like Stephen Gerrard will have found out in recent months, I don't think you realise how big both Rangers and Celtic are. They are not football clubs. They're institutions. And I think in England, people might disagree with us, but I think Man United certainly are, Liverpool certainly are. Beyond that? No. Not so sure. You went to Turkey. Yeah. To manage Galatasaray. Yeah. You got to the cup final. the experience. You got to the cup final. Mm -hmm. And you played Fenerbahce. Mm -hmm. And you beat Fenerbahce. Yeah. What did stadium. you do? What did you in their stadium? Well, Eighteen months prior, you know, I'd had open heart surgery. Yes. I take the job at Galatasaray. They have a board of directors. One of these, one of these boards said, "What are Galatasaray?" Fenerbahce is like Rangers Celtic without the daft religious side attached. So this director said, "What, what are Galatasaray doing? Signing a cripple?" And um, anyway, I thought that's not a nice thing. So nine months later. We play them in the cup final, two-legged cup final. We win 1-0 in our stadium, and we have to go there. And then it's 1-0 to them. And 92nd, 93rd minute, Dean Saunders lashes in a goal, so it's 1-1 on the night. We win the cup. Right. So everyone's going mad. Um, our, our players run down to where this, our supporters are, and a flag bigger than that screen is handed over the barbed wire fence. All the players took a turn to, to wave it. It's handed to me on a great big stick. I wave it. And I look to hand it to someone. They've all buggered off to the halfway line to get the cup. So I've got this flag. So I now start running back up to the halfway line with this flag. And I'm looking into the stands that are emptying. And I look into the director's box. And I can see this prick. Yeah. Was, and I can, I can see him, vividly see him standing up. And I'm thinking, I'll show you his fucking cripple. So I veered right, went to the middle of the pitch. Had two goes at getting into the ground. And um, eventually, for the third time I got it in, I turned around and I thought, that'll show him. And I quickly realised it, it wasn't the smartest move I've ever made. Because <laughs> now their supporters are trying to climb over the fences to, to get it. So I found a bit of pace from somewhere and I get underneath the police perspex shields yeah. and there's coins, everything coming down, lighters, coins. And I get into the tunnel. The tunnel's maybe the length of this room and it's dimly lit enough. Just as I'm thinking, fuck me, you got away with that one, son. Yeah. I got a clump on the side of the head. Right. Supporters got in the tunnel. So I'm having a bit of a wrestle up with him. And um, it went okay. And I get back to the dressing room. And I'm sitting in the dressing room with my right hand in an ice bucket. And I'm thinking, when the directors come down, there's your plane ticket. You're off tomorrow, son. Yeah. So when I'm, they come in, I've never kissed as many mustachioed men in my life. <laughs> Some of them had tears in their eyes. The greatest thing that's ever happened to this football club. So even today, part of Istanbul would still like to shoot me. Another part right. loves me. When it comes to what you're doing now for Sky, you're the number one uh, analyst. Not the best paid, maybe the one. Well, no. <laughs> No. It was a bit like when I worked at RTE, he was the best paid. I wasn't <laughs> it's the first time in my life I've actually thought of myself as a voice of reasoning. <laughs> <laughs> working with you. 
No, we had a great time. Yeah, we did. Uh, but to do that job properly does also require some fortitude, doesn't it? Because there's so much rubbish spoken and written about the game, uh, so much hype, so much bullshit. The way I see the job, I think my job is to point out things, be honest. Yeah. You know, I made a conscious decision 12 years ago when I got the sack at Newcastle. That's me finished with football management. Yep. And I've made a conscious decision. I'm now on the other side of the fence. Yep. I don't go out my way to be critical. But if I feel I'm, it's necessary, I will be. And I'm not, I don't give two monkeys who are upset. Yep. You've had a fabulous uh, life and career in football been... as a player. And now as an analyst, still really involved and in, in, clearly in love with the game. The players who are playing today and the guys you played with in that great Liverpool team that won three European Cups and five league titles. Is there a difference? Oh, it's an enormous difference, I think. And what is it? It's, it's a lack of taking responsibility. The two stories I told you there about my first game, what was he saying to me really there? Yeah. We've, we've got so much confidence in you, and confidence in you. You're responsible, you deal with it. Yes. Work it out. It's a famous saying at Liverpool, the most, maybe the most often said phrase, work it out for yourself, son. Yes. You know, that was always... Whew. Now, the modern player doesn't want responsibility. You know, he wants the least responsibility as possible. Yes. And that's, that's the difference. Um, Has the money made a difference? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think... Everybody in this room, I can't put my, my hand on my heart and say, if I was getting 250 grand a week as a young fella today, yeah. this wouldn't happen. Yeah. Really? You know, it's any walk of life, you give a young man too much too soon... That will happen. Right. They'll get in the armchair. Yeah. And I think that happens. What you've always had, you've always had top players who you don't, they're not interested in what they earn. Mm. You don't have to tell them if they've had a bad game. Right. You don't ask them to turn up and train properly every day. They do all that because it's yeah. in them. That's the top, top men. Yes. Now, there's always been a half a dozen top men in the country at any given time. It was the same when I played, it was the same before, yeah. and it's the same today. But below that, Half a dozen, there's a lot of right. good to average players. Now, that, those good to average players are on 100 grand upwards. And they swan around like they're the top men. Mm. And that's what you've got in football today. You know, footballers live in, and I, I come back to it, I'm, I can't put my hand on my heart and say it wouldn't have affected me. But they live in a, a bubble today where they've got personal shoppers. Yeah. You know, they don't know how to book a, a flight. Everything is done for them. Yeah. And, and fair play to them, they, you know, make the most of it, because I don't think it'll last forever. And a final, a final question, Messi or Ronaldo? I'm a Messi, I'm a Messi man. Messi. These are two, two ridiculously good footballers. They'd be in the top four, five players that have ever kicked a ball. Right. And why do I think Messi? I just think he's just a more of a team player. He creates more than what Ronaldo does, and he, he scores as many goals, and arguably works a little bit harder than them. But you take any of them. Any Graham, I, we've run out of time. I'd like That's to a shame, I've enjoyed it. I'd like to thank you very much, and I'd like all of you to put your hands together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.